remember to, if you have questions for our amazing speaker, Naomi Hirahara, please use the ask a question button below our faces. And if you wanna buy any of her amazing books, please use that green button to order the books from the Poison Pen. And I'm gonna get started with introducing Naomi. So we're gonna be talking about how to create characters worth reading, which I'm really excited to learn about. Naomi is the Edgar award-winning author of two mystery series set in Southern California, her Mas Arai series, did I say that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. I should always ask, when I read it in my head, I never say it out loud, I should, <laughs> I should ask in the, in the future before, um, which features a Hiroshima survivor and a LA gardener, ended with the publication of Hiroshima, Hiroshima Bay, which is the Japanese translation is gonna release in 2021, that's huge. The first in her Ellie Rush bicycle cop mystery, Murder on Bamboo Lane, received a T. Jefferson Parker Award. Her Hawaii mystery, Iced in Paradise, was released in September of 2019 with a second scheduled in 2022. Her new historic standalone set in 1944 Chicago, Clark and Division, will be published by Soho Crime during the summer of 2021. And a former nonfiction editor of the Rafu Shimpo newspaper. She has also written noir short stories, middle grade fiction, nonfiction history books. She was born in Pasadena and currently lives there today. And I will drop her link to her website in the chat. Naomi, you have written so many different kinds of books and so many different series. I'm really excited to hear you clearly know how to make characters worth reading because <laughs> if people weren't reading your books, they wouldn't, people wouldn't be ready to publish them. So I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Um, take it away, Naomi. I'm gonna go ahead and minimize my screen. Good morning, everybody. It's so nice to see friends in the chat box as well as people that are from very far away places. So welcome to the first session of our conference. For people like me on the West Coast, it's early, so I hope you have a cup of coffee. For myself, this is a good incentive for me to wake up early, take a shower, wear nice clothes, even put a piece of jewelry on and, and put on some lipstick. You know, what a con you know, that's that's unusual. And I read in the chat someone said there was no waiting at the ladies' room. So I guess that's one of the merits of having a virtual conference. Um, it's wonderful for me to be here. Thank you for the organizers. And um, I wanted to, sh I, I have a PowerPoint prepared, so I'm going to be setting that up right now for you. Okay, I think we're ready. Um, not quite yet. If it's okay. The, um, oh, when you mouse yes. over, yeah, you have to allow okay. which screen. Okay, sorry about that. Take okay. your time. Hold on, folks. No rush. Okay. Okay, now I share my screen. Where was that button? Okay, here we go. Let's see, share screen. Application window, got it, got it. And perfect. It is up. Okay. All right, so we can see you and we can see your PowerPoint, which is great. Okay. Okay. So how to create characters worth reading. Um, that is the title here. And um, I, I, in thinking about this whole topic, um, I've come to the conclusion, at least for me so far, that there's been two paths in creating characters. One, and these are my wonderful illustrations. <laughs> and one um, is that's more character driven and the other that's more scenario based. And you're probably saying, Naomi, what's the difference? I don't get it. Well, let me explain. Um, the character driven stories, and, and this to be honest is more what I've, um, been passionate about in terms of my past um, 10 mysteries that I've written. Um, this little drawing here is um, inspired by my colleague, Jacqueline Winspear, who's the writer of the Maisie Dobbs series. And she tells a story, um, and Maisie Dobbs is a former World War I nurse 
um, who eventually becomes a private investigator. And Jacqueline once, um, at least when I was there, told the story of being, I believe, in the UK. And then suddenly, magically, she saw Maisie Dobbs like walking. And this may happen to you. And of course, um, Jacqueline did not create Maisie out of a vacuum. It just so happens her own family members um, either survived or did not survive the Blit, um, World War I. So this was a topic that was she was very close to her. And, and for some reason, it just magically all came together one day. And for myself, um, especially my first um, series character, Masarai, in the same way I had very close um, um, feelings as well as a connection to a character like my like Masarai, he was inspired by my father. So there may be, you might be, and in the chat box, if you can say, if you tend to write more character-driven stories like um, call it out. Um, it for many of us, there's a reason why we feel compelled, and it doesn't have to be someone we have a direct connection to, but we have a passion um, for a certain character, and that that's what what comes to our mind first. I think in terms of um, mystery, especially series driven mysteries, that's what I love about our genre. Uh, whether it be like Vera, Wallander, Easy Rawlings, K Kinsey Mahone, a lot of times for these individual books, we may not even remember the plot that well, but we're connected to the characters. So if you um, are writing a book like this, um, one of the strengths um, of being having like a, a, a strong um, character is you have a sense of how you should handle handle the point of POV, whether it should be first person or third person. For myself, I knew I was writing this character of Masarai. He didn't really have a facility of language, even in English or Japanese. But so that's why I decided to do a close third, to do a limited omniscient kind of narrator. So in, in, in essence, this narrator would help to interpret like what's going on. So even though the narrator is not a person, it, it still has a personality of its own. So that might be your choice too, if you're dealing with a certain kind of character that's kind of difficult to understand, like, and maybe can't even articulate things that well. So first person is not an option. Many times in these character-driven stories, it comes out of, um, the setting just naturally evolves um, from who that person is. Like with Maisie, you know, it's a historical. It's um, she she uh, saw much tragedy during the war. Things like that will help you kind of um, give context to your character. And of course, if you have this very strong character, the different metaphors, the things that they're going to um, gravitate towards the things there in their life like i'm writing about a blue collar character who goes fishing and works with his hands loves um doesn't love gardening but does gardening as a profession so naturally those are the kind of things that appear in the narrative as well as all the sensory elements um from his world so um i'm just you know, just incorporate, just a reminder. I know many of you already know these things, but just a reminder when you're creating those character-driven stories to incorporate those elements. Now, another option um, is the scenario-driven dri stories. And to tell you quite honestly, I kind of, for many years, I kind of scoffed at that kind of um, building a story. And um, I read a book, many people have told me about this book, Save the Cat, that is um, you, uh, you, known as a, a screenwriting book, but there's also a subsequent one that's um, created for novel writing. I haven't read the, the latter one, but in the Save the Cat, the writer talks about 
um, come up with a high concept, you know, and once you have the concept, you build the characters from that. And because I, for years, had been more a character-driven writer, I'm, I'm thinking, what, what is this? But um, I've come to discover that I'm currently writing more of a scenario-driven story. So I've come across some challenges and I'm gonna be very honest in today's session, in the I'm gonna share with you the problems that I've had. And I figured that if you have problems, um, that's actually more helpful, you know, to share kind of the, the strategies you had to kind of unravel that problem. Now this drawing, one reason why I created a, uh, a drawing of based on Richard Matheson's The Duel, which was a short story, which eventually became a movie. I think it was Steven Spielberg's first movie, um, was it has a very strong scenario. Um, and then I'm not very good at drawing, <laughs> but I figure you can figure out what, what a vehicle looks like. So, and his, he had this scenario that there would be this travel weary salesman um, and he's in the passenger car and then he's trying to go home. And then he is being tailed and tormented by truck driver in a big rig. Anybody who's been in a car or drives a car, you know, has experienced this nightmare of road rage, right? So this is kind of a scenario that we all can relate to. Um, what I think is interesting is, and then also uh, uh, Stephen King, I believe, um, in his book on writing, he also oftentimes comes up with a certain scenario. For instance, in Pet Cemetery, he thought of um, this, um, this, this a cemetery that in which uh, when people or animals or people are buried there, they resurrect themselves, but they're not quite the same. So he knew what the scenario was going to be. And from there, he created his characters. So um, what I would say, if you're doing this kind of scenario driven story, consider the most um, personally provocative and relevant character to place in that scenario. And there's not one answer. For instance, Richard Matheson in his short story, he made his, his main character is a man named Man. His last name is M-A-N-N. -N. Um, so I believe he was getting to, this is like the every man kind of story. Um, he made him, a, there's not a whole lot of character. We just have hints of who he is as a character. We know that he's a family man that um, he has a good family life. So there's high stakes. We want this man to be alive. Um, for myself, I may think like, because there's so many stereotypes about Asian drivers, I might decide to make my driver Asian. And there's, at the end of the story, there's comeuppance. You know, he's uh, the driver, the Asian driver's being tormented and then he or she eventually wins. And in the same light, it could be someone who's um, older, younger, undocumented. All, there's no one right answer who this character can be. The thing is, it has to come from you. Not necessarily, I'm not saying your identity, but what you feel passionate about. Because that's what we all can bring to our writing. We have to bring our own personal fingerprint because that's what's going to make there, there's only limited number of plots. So we need to bring our own fingerprint into our characters. Now I mentioned um, problems. So um, what my situation was, I had written, uh, co-written a nonfiction book in, and it told of Japanese Americans who had been incarcerated um, during World War, from, mostly from California and they were in uh, a camp in um, the Owens Valley um, at the base of the Sierra Mad, uh, Nevada mountains. And then from there, um, there was an early release program and they were taken to Chicago, which was the second largest um, city in that time in this nation. And that's where many, many thousands of Japanese Americans found as a new start. Um, a government report had said that 
Um, as a result, because many of these newcomers were in their mid twenties, that was the average age. There were um, uh, babies being born out. There was a lot of problems. There were babies born out of wedlock. There was um, abortions, which was illegal at the time. There was a stick up man and there was a sexual predator. So when I saw that particular scenario, I go, I think this is, would be excellent as a mystery. So I have my own family, my own fictional family that I've taken through the same situation and they're dealing with a tragedy in Chicago. Um, I, but you know, you just can't have a scenario. You have to have the characters. And so my main characters is our two sisters. Um, and it's really the focus on the younger sister because the older sister is kind of the shining star and the younger sister has always been, you know, um, the one that's kind of followed in her footsteps. So now since some, uh, something has happened in Chicago, it's up to the younger sister to figure out the mystery, to unravel the mystery. So those, that's what I thought would make interesting characters in this particular scenario. But I had problems and I'm gonna to get to it in a moment. But um, before that, I wanted to get, I have a, a brief commercial on names because this is um, just one of the things that I, I feel strongly about. And again, anything I say today is not prescriptive. It doesn't mean you have to do it. But um, for instance, uh, I feel very, um, I, I need to name my characters, especially my main characters, um, before I can really get into the meat of the story. One of my colleagues, Alan Steinauer, who writes excellent spy novels, he's, um, I remember at some point he had writ, uh, said, communicated that he could just write XXX, like that's the name of his character, and he could just, you know, go on and, and put the, the names in later. And so, you know, any either approach is fine, but this is just my little commercial. And I do think it's important, um, especially if you're writing a series character, to get the character's name correct for you. I'm recommending that you find something that's unique and personal, that's meaningful. It um, in another language, it could um, maybe it it symbolizes who they are. Um, culturally appropriate, if you know, figure out a name and it uh, that makes sense for that who that person is in terms of their age, where they're from. Um, their ethnicity, their race, all those kind of things. You want to find something with a good rhythm. And also Google, now we have Google. So Google to check if anybody has that same name. If it's two or more people, you're fine. If nobody has that name, you're fine. If only one person out there has that name, you might have to tweak your name a little just because if there's only one other person with that name, they might come back to you and say, wait a minute, how come you stole my name? But, you know, um, so just just a, um, something to be aware of. Now, in, in my argument that names are important, and, and I've talked about this at other workshops, let's take the example of Sherlock Holmes. Who can be more or, or, um, iconic than Sherlock Holmes? He has, um, I think he's the most, a uh, well-known literary character in the whole world. Would we be so crazy about Sherlock Holmes if his name was Sherrington Hope or Sherringfold Holmes? Those two names are things that Conan Doyle, he thought about, he actually contemplated. Um, Conan Doyle, the writer, he knew that he wanted to use two surnames. So that was his um, shtick. That's what he was thinking of. So he actually took different names of people, some that he knew, some people who had gone to school with, some people who are famous constables, you know, in England, and he was like mixing it up. In terms of Holmes, he personally um, had a love for Oliver Wendell Holmes. So he had that personal connection. So that's how he came up with Holmes. And eventually um, he seized upon Sherlock Holmes. 
Um, another iconic person, um, fictional person, is Miss Marple. And Agatha Christie, she took from actual geographic er, um, uh, locations, the Marple Railroad Station, the Marple Hall. These are places she passed in visiting either her relatives or her um, she saw on a regular basis. And that stuck in her mind. Um, I've done this once um, for one of my characters because I was going to um, San Diego and there's a street called Genesee. And I go, Genesee, that's cool. So, you know, use all these things, be aware of all these things in your life. And um, in order to um, actually tag your character. In the particular book um, I'm rewriting right now, it's called Clark and Division. Um, I knew that the older sister, I oh, first of all, for the last name, because some Japanese names are so long, I knew I wanted to make it short. So that's why I decided on Ito. And there's and that's a very common name. But in terms of the first name, I knew I wanted to do Rose for the old older sister because I live in Pasadena and we have the Rose Parade and we have the Rose Bowl. Plus it's a very popular, it was a very popular name in the 1940s. And um, for the younger sister, I really, uh, I was playing around with Dorothy, Dot, Martha, and it just didn't seem right. And that, although I was developing my character, what, what I do is I actually handwrite, do I do it? I, I pick a certain journal that reflects my book. I, I, this is a kind of a funny little thing that I do because it viscerally, it like the outside cover has to kind of be connected to the book I'm working on. And I started writing um, different names. And then um, I seized upon Aki, which means autumn in Japanese. And I know a few Akis and just the fact that her name would be Japanese as, as and that would be different than her sister that has an American, more Americanized name. For some reason that all clicked to me. So that was kind of my process. Um, Dana, are there any questions that I should address at this time? Um, not at this time. People are just really enjoying what you're having to say. And I also put up a poll about where people's story starts. Um, and 61% said characters start, they start their book with the character. And 38% said they start with the plot or the scenario, um, but that everyone agrees that the characters really make the story. Um, so they're really just reacting to what you're saying. Um, let me just look if there's one question just came in. Oh, Tom is curious. Early in one of your Mas Aria novels, your protagonist shares, can't speak Chinese, I'm Japanese. Do you feel a necessity to clarify cultural differences to American readers? Oh, uh, for sure. Because mm -hmm. that's um, who we are. I mean, I think, and it's not only American. I know we have some people in other countries here, but um, I, I just, um, I'm finishing reading uh, Kwe Cartes. Um, he's a Ghanaian American, I guess black. He's, you know, he has a black American father or mother or, 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 and a Ghanaian other parent. But anyway, he has a wonderful, a new series. He has two series set in Ghana. And, and just for him to talk about language like Tui and Ga, I think we all want to learn. I think mystery writers are so curious. So we kind of, I, I think uh, uh, that particular line that I had included might have also um, been there to kind of um, show who Masarai was, like how he, how would he re react to someone saying those kind of things? So that's another thing to keep in mind because all people react in different ways. So, yeah. but, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take one more, there's one more okay. question and then we'll move on. Um, uh -huh. Paula is wondering, I believe you said Aki means autumn. Did yes. you also consider the contract between season, rose, spring, Aki, autumn? I did not, so thank you. <laughs> Don't you love when readers, <laughs> when, when readers identify things in your work that you didn't know? <laughs> well, you know what? I think all of us, there's the subconscious that's working. So. In, I, in the way I talk about my character, Masarai, because later on, Mas is a very 
a common nickname for a man uh, that fits his profile. But then later it's like Moss, that's Spanish. You know, I live in California, you know, the Latin American influence is important. And then Moss means more. So that's how I talk about him. He, Moss wants more out of life. And then a book club said, awry, you know, do you call him awry because things go awry? And I go, no, I was not conscious. But I, I really believe all of those things are kind of happening in our mind. Okay. So, right. And Tessa, we're going to get to your question after. She just has a meteor yeah. question. So we're going to okay. um, save some of these for the, for the end. Um, thank you. Okay. So um, I am going to uh, really share with you a challenge that I've been having th this year. I'm just going to be honest. So I'm glad you registered for this um, conference because this is not going. Uh, this is not a stock presentation, guys. <laughs> so um, I turned in my manuscript this year, and um, one thing I will say about traditional publishing that I find helpful is the access to really incredible editors. Um, I think eight out of 10 of my experiences have been phenomenal. And I, I couldn't hire these, I couldn't afford these editors. So anyway, I'm gonna, and I, I gave a heads up to my editor. I'm going, I'm gonna share some of the things in your editorial notes. And she said, okay, that's fine. Okay, so in other words, I had problems with my characters and I was shocked in some ways, in some ways I was shocked because this has never been an issue with me. And I think some of it is because I went from the scenario driven kind of angle to create my story. And I'm gonna read to you what, this is one section from this editorial letter. And she only read, this is from the first 90 pages. Since you've chosen first person for this story, you've had to forfeit third person narrative Pacing tricks of distance observation, perspective rotation, and camera cutting, all of which are normally staples of crime fiction, as you know. But in my opinion, at least, the storytelling tricks available to first-person narrators in terms of ramping up tension, psychological toying, and emotive connection are much more fun. I want to encourage you to deploy those strategies, psychological insight, private thoughts as much as possible to keep the reader immersed. So um, it, isn't that, Jewel? So whatever you're writing, maybe you're writing something first person. And these are things just for you to keep in mind. I really wanted to um, write this particular historical first person. I think it was appropriate for her. Um, because we're really, I wanted to really get into the head. I, I, I didn't want anything to divide the reader from my character. So that's why I've done first person. I've done first person for um, three of my um, 10 novels. I've never had a problem. I think those three were also women from the point, point of a female, but they were more contemporary. So, um, so there was something so I had to solve this problem. Now, um, one thing I do want to note too, um, I am a former journalist. So I think one thing that's helpful um, when you have that background is although I was shocked <laughs> that I missed the mark, on the other hand, um, I think as journalists, we, because we get a lot of feedback, we're, we're able to kind of um, separate our feelings, our identity of who we are with the work. And I would just, um, especially after you finish your first draft, I would encourage you to try to do that, um, um, to kind of divorce yourself um, from being personally affected and just looking at this like, okay, this is a problem. How am I gonna solve this problem? I'm gonna tell you how I, I solved my problem. I'm calling this treasures in the cigar box. and. Even if you write a more character-driven um, uh, uh, book, um, I, I think some of these things might help you as well. So um, growing up when I would read these books, especially ones that were set in rural areas, um, there was often a character that had a cigar box. And it's mostly a little boy, I guess. And he would put his treasures, like maybe his favorite marble in the cigar box. And I, oh, for some weird reason, I always wanted my own cigar box. And my dad smoked cigarettes and he didn't smoke cigars. 
But after um, I graduated from high school, I worked in the gift shop of the Biltmore Hotel in downtown Los Angeles, a very iconic hotel. And I sold um, candy, Playboy magazines, not proud of that, as well as cigars. So I had access to cigar box, a uh, cigar box. So I took it home and I put like important letters and things like that in there. And I started thinking at first to solve this problem of characters, I was going, oh, I need to do more research, this, that. Then it occurred to me, no, Naomi, you have to mine yourself. And this cigar box is like, um, my, of my mind, the cigar box of my mind. So again, an excellent drawing <laughs> of my cigar box. And here inside are things I, I pulled out to help me um, solve my problem. And of course, you are, have no idea what these symbols mean. So I'm going to explain it to you. Okay. First of all, okay, and these are like excerpts from the editorial letter. Um, so my editor had said, the bond that's supposed to exist between them, the two sisters, is not coming through. This is awful. This is, I mean, it's, this whole book is predicated on this, on this relationship with these two sisters. And I had, I, I missed the mark. So I was going, okay, Naomi, what are you going to do? I am the older sister. I have a brother that's eight and a half years younger than me. There's only two. And I, I normally say my brother idolizes me. So we, we have a great relationship. So, but this is not, these are two sisters that are separated by three years. And I'm writing from the younger sister's point of view. And I, I it, it occurred to me, I need to talk to younger sisters. And I have two close friends who are younger sisters. And, and the older sister is the shining star. So um, I called them up and I explained to them and they were more than happy to ve be very vulnerable. They know, they knew that I'm not going to name them, but um, they shared with me um, certain things that they did, their feelings. And although these two women had very different experiences, it gave me a little more depth of what my character needed to do and how to feel. So what I would suggest to you, if you feel you're having a problem building a character is actually talk to people. If you're writing about a firefighter um, and you're not a firefighter, you know, um, maybe don't call him right now, <laughs> wait till all these fires are gone, but maybe talk to a retired firefighter, but um, contact people and people are more than willing to chat with you. Um, there was even one person on another uh, issue that I only knew through Facebook. And I just said, can I, can I communicate with you about this subject matter? And we had a Zoom session and she shared with me and it was really helpful. So um, I know as writers, we just want to, we think that all we need to do is imagine things, but we, but to be honest, we're limited. And sometimes we need to talk to other people. Okay, um, this was another quote. Give us a lot more insight into Aki's thoughts and feelings. And um, Aki, uh, there's uh, scenes when she was young and she um, didn't have many friends, she was lonely. And um, I haven't had as many problems like making friends, but there's been incidents where I have felt like on the out, like I've hid in the ladies' room in a stall because I didn't want to deal with outs, you know, people on the outside. So I had to mine these, you know, and these vulnerable experiences. We don't really want to go there a lot of times, but um, I think when we're building these characters, we need to travel there and kind of parse it out and sit in that experience, and it might not be pleasant but um, it could be helpful. Okay, um, so books. Oh, another thing is, I know we have some movie people here um, in the class, but I will say, if you're writing a book, um, lean on books um, and not on movies. I love movies, but I think we as novelists, we have tools available to us that um, movie makers don't have. 
And and this is why it's so important, especially for you, uh, pe- uh, those of us, I think all people, unpublished and published, is to read. Because these we do steal, and we are inspired by other writers. And the more books we uh, read, they're like floating around in our mind, they're sparking. And it's not necessarily plagiarism, it's just like creating its own thing. So I think that's why it's, it, and then that's why it's uh, good for us to be older too, if, we, if we've been reading consistently over that time, because we have more things to pull up. So my editors had written, if you think of Aki as the Nick Carraway of the story and Rose the Gatsby, you know, this is again, talking about point of view and I'm going, oh my goodness, the Great Gatsby. Yeah, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily a huge fan of the Great Gatsby, but you know, I started thinking, you know what, maybe I should revisit it. And luckily it's not a very long novel. And so I read it um, and it had been decades since I had last read it. And then one of my friends is an amateur historian of the Great Gatsby. She actually has a a theory that Jay Gatsby is half black, which is super fascinating. But anyway, so um, I talked to her because she loves this. The Great Gatsby is one of her two most favorite books. I go, why do you like this so much? And then she went over certain um, passages that she just thought were genius. So to tell you honestly, I'm not sure how much that affected my reworking of the book, but you never know. And I think it's always good to be steeped in good writing because it could it could affect you and inspire you in ways, in very positive ways. Okay, and this is kind of the last thing that was in our box and which are not necessarily good things, but emotional and cultural blocks. Um, sh- uh, my editor had written, almost never lets us into her psychology. Um, my main character is very guarded. She, you know, and this is first person. And um, she, even to herself, I mean, these horror, these very challenging things are happening to her, but she never like dwells on it. Um, and she rac- her, she and her family react in ways that may seem kind of puzzling to people. And I think for myself, I probably share the same psychology as Aki in my mind, you know, and I I also am taking um, an improv class and we're doing some things on Zoom. And just this week, um, the instructor was saying, Naomi, you have to name it. And I'm going, oh, this is my cultural block, emotional cultural block. Sometimes I don't wanna name things. And um, so this book has kind of challenged me to kind of get over that block. Um, I don't wanna be didactic in my writing, but I also don't want to change who Aki is. So this is a passage, you know, it um, I've written to add um, to kind of under to kind of explain her psychology. So I, I wanted to read this to you. By this time, we understood how the world worked for us to articulate the attitudes against us would give them power and credence. We preferred to re- release the pain silently let it rise in invisible balloons that we couldn't see, but we could feel, bumping against our foreheads and shoulders, warning us not to stray too far from what was expected. So, um, so those kind, so I'm coming up with those kind of things that give the reader a sense of of the psychology without spelling it totally out. Okay. Oh, and then yeah, and so. All of us, I know right now there's a lot of discussion about um, white people not understanding people of color, but we all, every person has emotional and cultural blocks, you know, and we all need to, and as writers, if we're writing novels, we all have to kind of look at ourselves and kind of parse it out and wrestle and, and, and deal with it. So it, it's it's not meant for one group of people, it's all of us as human beings. Okay. Oh, and there's always more. This is a laptop, if you could, <laughs> you didn't recognize what it is. So there's always more research. And um, as doing a historical, what's wonderful is ancestry.com. 
So I found an actual yearbook from the high school that I have Rose going to. And then from that yearbook, I was like, oh, okay, they're, this is the, I had an idea what they wore, but it was like, oh, this is the specific clothing and other activities. So that gave more concrete details that helped in building the character. Okay, so what's going on with this thing that I've been working on? Well, I have good news to report. So the latest draft of the beginning, my editor said it was engrossing, exciting to watch. So yay. <laughs> um, so this, this, this method, I think was successful to, um, so this was again for me. And in summary, for me, what worked was to interview more people, to mine your vulnerable moments, to refer to other novels, especially the classics. Um, you know, I think we're all um, inspired by, you know, the mo most recent bestseller, but it's, I think it's good to read dead people, you know, <laughs> and to be, and, and, and there's a reason why a book is classic as well. Be aware of your emo emotional and cultural blocks and more for more saltiness, do more research, okay? And then, oh, I, I write um, an occasional blog. You can find it on my website. And because I'm a former journalist, I was kind of like bragging, I don't get writer's block, you know? Um, that's not an issue for me. Okay, and this year with the pandemic, it's been hard. So this is just a tip to mo motivate you to do the hard work, or at least this is what's helped me and I've been um, doing writing and rewriting sprints um, via social media like Facebook and Zoom. It's also called Writing Alone Together. And you're wondering, what is this? What is that? So basically, it, even through this conference, maybe you could, um, and with, um, ver you know, with Zoom and things, you can be, be located anywhere in the world as long as the time difference works. Um, if you are having a challenge, maybe ask like, hey, let's get together and let's um, on Zoom or on Facebook or whatever. You could even, I guess, use your phone and, and just do a group text like, okay, sit down and write for 20 to 30 minutes. You do that. And then you could like check uh, touch base. You could talk a little and then you launch into another sprint. And this. I, uh, the way I look at it is like, I'm on that diving board and some, for some reason, I think if we all know what it is, <laughs> the pandemic, we don't want to jump into that pool and just doing these kind of planned things kind of help push you to get into the pool. Okay, so questions. Oh, and this is um, my website, look at my website. Um, and you could also look at the Writing Wednesday sections. This is what I used to do on Facebook. I just put it on my blog. And look, and, and if you're curious about this book that I'm working on, it's coming out in the summer, probably, I think August, 2021, Clark and Division. So. I'm very excited about that novel. That okay, amazing. so we have, what, 15 minutes, cool. We do. We have time. We have a number of meaty questions, though, so I hope we're able to get to all of them. Uh -huh. um, so Tessa wants to know, can you speak more to the issue about using stereotypes to your character's advantage? You had mentioned the stereotype about Asian drivers and how you can turn that on its head. Um, can you speak a little bit more about using that? Well, I, I think, you know, when you're writing about real people, it's um, OK, for instance, <laughs> Um, for Masarai, like there's a stereotype that like Japanese people are good at gardening. You know, I myself kill plants. So, and um, so in in Masa's world, um, there's other gardeners that are hired just because they're Japanese. Like, oh, you know, I have a Japanese gardener, you know, they, and right now it's kind of funny because Mr. Miyagi is like popular with the Cobra Kai series. Um, so, but, so I have people in his world who are terrible gardeners because it's the reality. So I would just say just um, there's always a little bit, of, there may be a tiny bit of truth to the stereotype, but there's often a lot of untruth. So kind of like embrace both of them and just show it and you could show it through character. Mm -hmm. Love it. 
And Rita and some other folks are wondering, in fiction, do you ever use some of your own characteristics? I think for all of us, I think every character should have something that's within yourself. So within that cigar box, like especially the experiences thing, there's a part of, there's especially your villain, um, there should be, th and then one thing we, when you think about annoying people in your life, usually they have your similar characteristics, but they're not very good at hiding it. And so <laughs> that's where, where you kind of have to own, you know, the things within yourself and that, that will help you build um, characters. Mm. Um, and then do you have any creative tips, um, Shelly's wondering, for coming up with creative descriptions for side characters other than hair, eye color, height? Well, names, mm. you know, utilize the names. Um, so um, in Maserai, there's a guy named Tug um, and he's like big and he's so dependable. And that's one reason why I, I have I use that particular nickname. There's another uh, character called Wishbone, and um, he's kind of bow-legged, and that's why he got that name. But he's the most unlucky person in the world, <laughs> and and that's why it's kind of funny to kind of play off those kind of things. Um, I think for side character, okay, I like to use the word pungent to make, a, and they have to add flavor right to, and it, it's just we're all cooking right now and um so use your spice drawer you know there's some things that you need to add sweetness you know maybe your character and and this is a thing that i learned from jan burke um if you have a kind of unlikable main character um and and my character moss is kind of unlikable in some ways um have a best friend that is so sweet and I I have that in his best friend Haro because if you figured that that best friend sees something good in that person that there must be something good in that person so that's a good technique to use and it, I think if you're writing something um, very serious I mean I'm a big believer that you need a tiny bit of humor in anything you write so add that spice with that certain character. Um, but yeah, physicality is always good. But, um, but I think it's these other things, more the personality um, that, that's more important. Um, and Roseanne is wondering if you, um, and we'll ask this of some of our other authors, had feelings about writing characters wearing masks in the pandemic aware world. Um, since we don't know where precautions are headed, um, should we have them and how then to address problems they bring to an investigator since masks will damage descriptions of witnesses, et cetera. So I think this is a good question, I think not just for the pandemic, but like the t writing in the timeliness when you d when a book is gonna be publishing probably a year from now, um, when you don't really know what the future is going to hold. Um, we actually, we pre pre-recorded the session with Michael Connolly and Matt Coyle. And I, I thought those two had contrasting opinions. So definitely tune into the, I know you all are going to tune into Michael Connolly anyway, but I, I think they both have perspectives. I'm dealing with this. So my Hawaii novel um, is, luckily it's coming out in 2022. But it's not only the mass, but travel. You know, when we think of Hawaii, we think, and, and right now there's like a lot of quarantining that are happening in places like Hawaii. Um, there's a lot of animosity actually towards tourists going to Hawaii right now. And it's all rooted to disease um, and um, COVID-19. And um, I'm really not going to start writing it um, I have ideas right now. I'm going to be writing it um, next year. I've decided because in a way like travel has become kind of politicized. So it's like, how am I going to deal with this? I'm actually going to make the victim a tourist. And actually someone like me, <laughs> a middle-aged like person from California. And 
um, I, I thought, you know, let's take the bull by the horns and let, you know, maybe I'm naming it, you know, I'm just taking it and let's like kind of investigate all these issues that the pandemic has brought out, like about sustainable tourism, about these kind of things. So everybody has a different answer. And who, the thing is, who knows um, how it's all going to happen? Now, you know, we, we're in the thick of it. So it's too hard, too difficult. I will say this. Because to me, uh, World War II is such a seminal time, and I've written about it in fiction and nonfiction. I feel like how can you write about the 1940s without mentioning World War II? And it kind of seems like how can you write about something like in 2020 without make, mentioning something about the pandemic? And I've heard a lot of writers now are dating their piece like 19, uh, 2019, like before it. But it that seems like kind of a cop out. <laughs> so I think all of us will be wrestling. We'll have different answers. But I, my answer is I'm going to kind of get messy, you know, start wrestling, mud wrestling, mud wrestling yeah. the pandemic. <laughs> well, I think it speaks to Roseanne's idea about in theory, it could add to tension and raise stakes because mm -hmm. investigations, things are more difficult. It also in some ways like is more of a locked room mystery when no one can leave, right? You know, no one can leave the country, no one can go anywhere. So I think you're right. It's either do we use this to our advantage and raise the stakes and heighten tension, or do we make it 2019 and kind of opt out of the whole the whole thing? Um, and then Elaine is wondering, she agrees wholeheartedly regarding your comment on writer's block. Um, she's a former journalist and responded well to deadlines. Um, do you use a technique to help with this or is it submitting pages to the editor? You know what I would do with my first manuscript? Yeah. I would have um, writing workshops and um, I would read my pages and I would tell people, I don't want your comments. <laughs> I know it's really weird, but it was just a way, you know, maybe you could do that on Zoom, but sometimes you don't want any inputs especially if you haven't finished it but you need that push you need to have that good six pages like a, a week and just i think accountability you know i don't look like it but i used to run you're a runner right dana and um and then i, I the most i did was like a half marathon and like you know for for each week you have a goal you know and i think oh and this is what they say i have a accountability partner run with another person and actually i do that right now with exercise with zoom like there's people i don't even know that well on facebook but every five o'clock they're like i'm getting ready to zoom and then we all tune in and we just exercise together i could do that on my own but somehow knowing there's other people bothering me <laughs> not bothering me but pinging me it, it's helpful so i i would say have those personal, I would always have personal goals, but right now with the pandemic, I'll be perfectly honest, it's harder. Um, it's a harder slog and I'm not as productive. So I would say also adjust your expectations. Don't try to, we can't, I can't do as much as I used to, but it's okay. You know, do 85%, 75%, because if you have more realistic expectations, you won't be disappointed or deflated if you don't meet them. I agree. Having grace, you know, we are in a crisis, right? Like it's not, we're not just working at home. It's we're in a mm -hmm. crisis. And so being graceful with yourself. I also read something about, um, we are more, we respond better to the fear of loss than we do to rewards gained. So we are more inclined to, you know, do something to prevent losing a hundred dollars than we would to go make a hundred dollars. And so I've heard of people, telling accountability partners, if I don't do this, I'm paying you $100. Like if I don't give you my pages, I owe you 100 bucks and it keeps them more on track than the reward at the end of yeah. the book and getting the book contract, which I find I find that fascinating. I, um, I, I heard this one filmmaker, she said she would donate to a cause that she absolutely abhorred. <laughs> she didn't yeah. meet her goal and that actually yeah. helped her. <laughs> It does because it's a fear of loss over the like, if you do this, you're going to get your book sold or your, or your okay, screenplay yeah, yeah, produced yeah. or whatever. And no, if you, you know, unless you, if you don't do this, you're going to have to donate to some cause that you hate. And yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a thing. Um, and then 
Uh, HSS is wondering if you are a pantser or a plotter, and then how do you revise? You know, I I re rethinking when I was developing this presentation, I started to think I don't like that definition of pantser and plotter. Um, I know we talk about that often, but I think in our minds. Okay, whether you're more intuitive or you're more deliberate in making that outline, you're you are outlining in your mind whether you know it or not. Um, I think that's why when we read all these books, it's kind of I liken it to classical music. Like we kind of know, okay, this beat has to happen here. So um, in terms of being deliberate with the with the, with okay with this scenario Durbin book. Oh, and I've been using a lot of. Um, Oh, Evernote. Evernote, I've been using. It, this Evernote has been new to me. Um, when I co wrote a book with a friend, I um, mean, she was in charge of the pictures, photos, she used it. She used Evernote. And I was going, this is kind of handy. So I like Evernote because I can have it on my phone. Um, and I just like before when we were, well, I guess we are still standing in line if you want takeout from a popular place. But I would just start looking at my chapters. I would have my chapters on different Evernotes and I would just kind of add to it. So um, my process usually is that visceral notebook, that notebook, and then I'll just start writing, you know, do brainstorming. And then from there, you know, once I have, I mean, yeah, character building, you know, once I have the name of my character and my characters, I could start building on the computer. And then I'll just open up a Microsoft Word document, and 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 now what I it before I had to be so linear, but now I jump around like there's going to be a scene like in this in chapter twenty or a later chapter. I won't name the chapters at that time. I'll just do a a stream of not a stream of consciousness, but I'll just write do free writing on a Word document, and from there there I start parsing it out and put it on Evernote and making different chapters and then adding to that all of this is subject should subject to change for sure and we have one more we have a few more questions we have time for one more but remember naomi's going to be coming back for the um panel discussion this afternoon so if i didn't get to everyone's question don't worry you'll have time to ask it um rita is wondering about you know because you write historical as well as contemporary books do you use words or names that are appropriate for the time, or do you kind of smooth over the language so as not to offend, um, you know, if some of that language is maybe offensive or not PC for the contemporary audience? Well, my friend, um, uh, well, I've recommended like looking at books that were written in that time. If you've um, read like In a Lonely Place, a Dorothy B. Hughes, if you read the, like these classical books written like in the 1940s or 30s or whatever, a lot of times they it, they don't necessarily use a lot of idiomatic language. You know, it's very plain, and it um, kind of works in our era. So, just don't be. I mean, unless you, I like for me, I'm kind of steeped in like Japanese American culture. That's one of my strengths. So I'm going to put those kind of things in there. But if you don't have a, a special relationship to a people or place, you know, just use plain language. Of course, the whole thing about um, uh, racial epithets, you know, all those, you, you're going to have all sorts of different opinions. And my my friend Gary Phillips, who's African American, he he thinks just go for it, you know, be real, you know. So you have again you have to kind of make that decision of where you want to go and what kind of book you're writing for myself like in the um in my novel it's like an older person kind of writing what happened before so in the narrative she's using like black but then in some of the um dialogue she's negro because that that was you know the term that was used you know i have japs in the in my uh, manuscript just because it was World War II and that's what people said. I mean, I don't litter, it, litter, litter my manuscript with it, but when it's appropriate, I use it. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's no fast 
rule, just stand by your work, you know, and don't, I would say, don't be scared. People are going to say things, you know, either which way and just make your decision and just stand by your decision and don't be hurt if someone has a different opinion because we're asking people to read our things, right? That's, and what an honor for them to spend their time. And if they're going to get mad, they get mad. There's going to be plenty of people who like your work on the other side too. Yeah. What a great way to finish up the session, Naomi. Thank you so much. Everyone has really been talking through the chat and really loved everything you said. Um, and just a reminder, if you want to check out all these amazing books and see how Naomi creates characters worth reading, the best way to do that is to buy her books through the poison pen uh, below. Um, you're at a free conference, so you have your registration fee. You can use it towards buying books. Um, and then the replay will be available right here afterwards. Um, but we're going to go to the next session in about after our 15-minute break. Um, so just stay right here. Go get a drink of water. Use the restroom. We'll be back here in 15 minutes um, to talk about agents and publishing. So, Naomi, thank you so much. This was wonderful. See you later, everyone. Bye.